Clint Corver, Ulu Ventures. What are the implications of some of these trends? <coughs> Excuse me, for the nonprofit world and philanthropy? It's a great question. I think that Obama taught us that the most valuable donor is the $104 donor within each and every one of us. And why I say $104 donor is I think we're all going to turn around and figure out what our $2 a week charities are going to be. And we're going to line them up and we're going to give $2 a week to a couple of different causes and we're going to be really engaged in an active participatory, very local way. By local, I don't mean geographically local. I mean locally, emotionally engaged in a big and meaningful way. I think what you're starting to see already with Twitter and some of the other tools that turn into a conversation between yourself and the charity you participate in, there's, it, it's going to be the way of the future. I think what's over is going to be the society balls. What's over is going to be the big, big corporate sponsorships in that they may be interesting as challenges, but they're going to be a big pushback against that. If a corporation takes over a charity, it's not going to feel like a charity you want to be part of as a $2 a week person. I think you really want to leave your imprint like where you feel like you do matter, like you're worthy of that email. You're worthy of that correspondence. You're worthy of that connection. I think it's really going to get very grassroots. I think you're going to see an awful lot of philanthropy um, recognize that everybody's voice carries equal weight because of connectivity. And so I think you're going to see also a lot more money spent on programming, in terms of programming directly back to the donor electronically, and programming that goes actually out to whatever the cause is, and a lot less spent on fundraising. I don't think you're going to have as much glitzy development activities. I also think there's going to be a horrible, horrible, horrible fallout after Madoff about how is this money being invested. Because I think a lot of us feel like the only place our money is safe right now is if we have a safe underneath our beds. And I think that we're gonna really wanna know what's going on when you give your money away. Where's your money going? I mean, if you gave your money to Tufts, it might have been invested with Madoff. If you gave your money to Harvard, it may have been invested in these ridiculous hedge funds that were so at risk that you know it's lost well beyond what the marketplace has lost. So I think that you're gonna, Fine, I think that donors are going to really push back and say, you know, how risky is the investment with the money I've put forward? And they're going to behave that way over their $2 a week, just as they might have if they'd given you $2 million. So, Mary, for some of the large uh, corporations in the room that, that have very worthwhile foundations, what kind of advice would you would you uh, offer them in this in this era of two dollar weekly donations from individuals? I think they have to link it back to their everyday customer. The fact the customer wants to feel empowered that the money that that foundation has somehow was earned off the back of the everyday customer, and it needs to come back to feel relevant and meaningful to the customer and the sacrifice the customer made to to make their patronage part of that company's profits. I think we all want to be treated with a different kind of respect, and it's a much less opulent respect. It isn't about um, big cars and big buildings today. It's about a meaningful difference. And I think that contributions need to come with um, output. So you need to actually know what does the money go for, what kind of difference is it going to make. So I think that, again, you're going to see a lot more demand for what are the results and how can the results be measured and why this organization versus another organization and how do I continue to monitor their progress so in, in, a, in a totally transparent format. Okay, any other questions? We have time for one more. One up here. Thanks, this is interesting. Um, I just wanted to see if you could talk a little bit more. At the beginning, you talked about the convergence, especially of you know, your public and personal life, and then towards the end, um, talking about um, people really watching their behaviors and you know not doing anything that your grandma wouldn't approve of. Um, and we see with you know Facebooks and Twitters and different things, you know, there's definitely a clash there. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Well, I mean, I'm not sure that there really is going to be a clash because I think that some of us are going to reign. I think people are going to start to rein themselves in, um, in terms of how they behave, because there's a recognition there's no more privacy. 
um, there's total recall. Um, so I think the constraint that you're going to live under is what you do is going to be searchable now and in the future, and that's going to be the lesson you're going to live by. So in the same way, most people grew up always saying, well, if you did that, you had a police record. Your police record would always be searched. Today, your Facebook record can always be searched. Your Twitter record can always be searched. I mean, I think that there's got to be this recognition of that's the last line. So if you're comfortable with it being there, it's a little bit like getting a tattoo. If you're comfortable with that tattoo on your arm in 30 years, then have a tattoo. If you're not, don't do it. And I think that is going to be the new mantra. And I think you're starting to see 17, 18, 19-year-olds really understand that maybe better than 30-year-olds are. Because 30-year-olds have the luxury of privacy for a little bit of their lives. It's, it's easier never to have something and to lose something. And I think that actually is the generation gap, is those people who have never had it versus those people who are losing it. All right. Anybody else have a final question in the back of the room? Hi, Marion. This is Carrie Brock with Porter Novelli. I'm wondering if you can give us an example of a company or companies that you've seen start to embrace some of the concepts or the trends that you talked about today, and maybe an example of how they've used that to their advantage to date. I mean, I think the most successful turnaround I've seen in the last six or seven months has absolutely been Pepsi's rebirth. I mean, I think they've come out of absolute obscurity. To me, all soft drinks were equally ridiculous this time last year. I think that they were outdated, they were sort of geriatric sugar water stuff, and I feel like in the last four or five months, um, Pepsi managed to make itself relevant to the next generation of millennials, um, and carried forward the generation that grew up in the 70s by really reinstating their sense of youthfulness um, with a whole range of messages that kind of marry your enthusiasm for the 70s, your enthusiasm for change, your passion for embracing connectivity in the internet, um, your love of rock and roll, but your love of kind of modern digital music. I mean, I think they've managed to marry up use of broadcast and big powerful television with um, very, very interesting novel internet stuff with outdoor billboard. They've managed to go with very powerful, simple colors. I mean, I think that they've been out there with PR messages. They've handled their layoffs in the most tasteful way possible. I think they've been, um, by and large, a pretty successful PR story. So I'd say they've been the very best at a time when I feel like Coke's been a lot more asleep. I mean, they're not our client, they're just something I've been watching. I'd say Walmart has been almost as good. Again, not, um, not our client in any meaningful, in any meaningful way. Um, I think that both companies have just been of the times. They've understood the zeitgeist. They've taken the risk. Everything hasn't been perfect. They've acknowledged when they've had to change. They acknowledge that their portfolio of products and services isn't ideal, and they speak to people about the reality of the imperfections of today, and they get on with it. Uh, but they're bold and out there, and they um, really have, again, embraced all the tools of what's happening in today's world. And I think that's the difference. You cannot hide. I mean, if you're going to hunker down and pretend this stuff isn't going on, you can just forget it. Um, you will be discovered and betrayed by your customer or by your competitor in a flash. Okay, we are going to have one final, final question 